And he thinks that's a basis, that's an interest that everyone has in common. He's trying to find, in other words, something in common that people can appeal to. You ought not to think in Hobbes' case that he thinks that everyone is self-interested and that they have no other motives. It, it's clear in the Leviathan he has a notion of the honorable person who is moved by justice and a variety of other virtues. He thinks that politically, when it comes to political issues, that's not reliable. It's not with most people a strong enough motivation to determine how and when they're going to behave. So he's trying to find this other basis, and he's appealing to uh, rational interests that we all have now. Do you know why it does that? A little too loud. It is too loud. Okay. So he's appealing to. John. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he's appealing to an interest that he thinks we almost everybody has, except for religious or fanatics and people that sort of we can't do anything. About. You read passages of the Leviathan, he really detests certain kind of sectarian fanatics. It's very clear. Well, so that's Hobbes' problem. And he's appealing to a presently existing rational self-interest that he thinks everyone can. Now, Hobbes, uh, Mark's problem, I think, is altogether different. He wants to provide a justification for resistance to the crown within a mixed monarchy, or within a mixed constitution, would be a better way to put it. This is a constitution in which the crown has a share in the legislative power. Is that a too loud, or is that a... And in which the crown has a share in the legislative power, as the king did in those days through the exercise of the prerogative of the various other things. Now, Mamak is preoccupied with this problem because he's involved in what's known as the exclusion crisis of 16. 79 to 81. It was so named because the party which acquired that name of the Whig under the leadership of the first Earl Shaftesbury sought to prevent Charles's younger son, who was then Duke of York, his younger, I'm sorry, his younger brother, the, uh, uh, James, who was then the Duke of York, from succeeding to the throne. Now, James was a Catholic, and we feared that with French help and with subsidies from Louis XIV, uh, which of course the, those were secret subsidies, but they were, but they were suspected and actually the case, that it was James's intent to turn England into a Catholic state. Uh, and constitution royal asterisks. That was what they believed. That's what Shaftesbury was afraid of. And that's what they were concerned about. And the Whigs were actually defeated in this effort. I won't go into those details. The Whigs were defeated in this effort. Now, Mark was close to Shaftesbury, off and on beginning 1666. Uh, Shaftesbury was a great earl. Mark lived in his London home, uh, where he had an apartment or an extra house on the Strand. And the uh, first draft of the essays and understanding was written there. It's estimated, I believe, in 1671. And uh, two treatises uh, were written in 1679 to 81 with other additions and alterations 
up to 83, and then there were other parts added in 1689. But the substance of the book, the main part of the second treatise is in those years, in those of the two years, and the second treatise was written first. It's his statement of his view. And the fact that it was written in the exclusion controversy explains a lot of its tone. And her evolution is to come. It hasn't come yet, the bulk of the book. And Mark is concerned with the rewrite of the powers, particularly the powers of the king to dissolve parliament and not to call it. Uh, because Charles, because he was had subsidies and independent monies of from elsewhere, he didn't have to call Parliament and he could govern it without it. And he did so from 81 to 85, even though that was in violation of the Triennial Act. He died in 85. So he was able to do that because he could be independent of Parliament. And but that explains a lot of the preoccupation of Locke with that issue, because that was the burning issue of the day. Now, I, I ought to explain this. Uh, well, I want to draw the contrast then. Here we have Hobbes who's concerned with trying to give an argument based on rational self-interest as to why people should support an effective absolute sovereign who now exists. Whereas Mark is doing something quite different. He's trying to give a justification for resisting a sovereign who he thinks is attempting to become absolute. And he is trying to do that, as we will see, on the basis of an argument that says that all political authority can be founded only in consent. And if we work out to what that means, no rational people within the bounds of the law of nature would consent to an absolute regime. So we get really a sharp contract, or whatever the other similarities there might be in their intention and their point of view. Mott is actively himself engaged in uh, what borders on treason during this period of time, Charles is eyes, and so he's not somebody uh, whose prime aim is to argue against revolution, even against absolute monarchy. Now, I ought to mention that Mark, in, the, in this, in the years from 79 to 83, when he led the hollow, is engaged in very dangerous activity. It was believed that the assuming all the, the account of this is it lasted and is now um, fairly well known, that there was agreement, seems to have been that if the third explosion bill failed, that there would be active resistance, forceful resistance. Uh, Mark followed Shaftesbury in these plans. He even went up to Oxford and hunted lodgings uh, for Shaftesbury's entourage, including a man named Ramsey, who Matthew describes as the chief of Shaftesbury's desperados, I guess, um, for the person who's going to be active in, in, the, in the armed resistance of the king's troops and so on. He was engaged in very dangerous work, and then he seems to have been engaged in this mention of this, I believe, in the McPherson, uh, in the insurrection plot, at any rate, he attended the meetings of this, uh, seated at the Earl of Sussex, uh, the Earl of Essex, and also perhaps even uh, in the Rye House or assassination plot. So he had to leave. So I have gone into this only to indicate some background to give you some sense of what Locke's objective is in this book, or what appears to be so far as we can gather uh, from this, and to make you aware of the contrast with that, uh, with the aim of case of Hobbes. Well, let me, I'll now go on to saying something about 
Mm -hmm. in the meaning of natural law, and I will try to do this rather briefly. I want to discuss eventually the fundamental law of nature, uh, which is itself a natural law, so in a way I'm beginning to clarify that notion. Now, the basic meaning of natural law, I take it, is this. It is that part of the law of God that can be known by us by our powers of natural reason. But as these powers discern and reflect about the order of nature, which is open to a public view, that's a thing that we can investigate. And in the order of nature, we can discern there, from this view, what God's intentions must, what God's intentions must be for us. And since God has authority over us, legitimate authority over us, God's intentions, or the principles that characterize it, are laws for us. Now that's the point of the phrase, or the term natural in the name natural law. In other words, the point of it is it refers to the fact that it's known by a natural faculty of reason from facts of nature. And it's that part of the law of God that we can ascertain in that way. All right, so what's the point of the term law in the, in the name natural law? I'm asking that in the soup point of the term law is that it is literally law. That is, it is promulgated to us by someone who has legitimate authority over us. The idea is that God is, as it were, the sovereign of the world and has this authority. And to say that natural law is promulgated, that is, to use that uh, verb is, of course, metaphorical in the sense that God's law is promulgated as the laws of primarily sovereigns are, as in parliaments and public enactments. But the idea is that even so, it is naturally law in the sense of the enactments of someone who had the legitimate legislative authority over all mankind. And this explains the account of law. Now, in the case of this, we want to make a contract uh, in natural law with a divine law. So the divine law is that part of the law of God that's beyond our powers of reason, that we cannot know from the order of nature using these powers. And our knowledge of it is a plan entirely on revelation. Well, that's a contrast there to keep in mind uh, with a uh, natural law. And, I'm sorry, divine law. And moreover, natural law is, of course, distinct from the actual law of states, or what Marx sometimes uh, refers to as a municipal law. Uh, the laws of States are to conform to the principles of natural law when these are applicable. As Mott says, uh, I'll refer to uh, the numbers always of the main paragraphs in the second treatise, unless I otherwise say. But in 135, uh, Mott says that the obligations of the law of nature hold in society as well as in the state of nature, and that the fundamental law of nature, and I quote, stands as an eternal rule to all men, legislators as well as to others. So thus the fundamental principles of natural law are basic norms that are applicable to political institutions and to legal systems, uh, and this, I suppose, is another reason or another explanation of the propriety of the, of the term law. These are principles that apply to political and legal institutions. 
Now, a final point. We ought to notice that this principle that Locke refers to as the fundamental law of nature is not ex itself the very basic principle of Locke's uh, moral and philosophical theology. The reason is there must be some further principle or account of why God has legitimate authority. And it may be in giving an account of that, some principle will be appealed to. Now, in the fourth essay on, on the laws of nature, which is an early book of, of, of Locke's, which he did himself publish in the remote 1660s, but this would then only serve as an example of the kind of thing I mean, Locke said that God has a legitimate authority over us in view of something that, that we might call the right of creation. Because God has created us out of nothing, because every moment God must, as it were, sustain us in being, if we are to continue to exist, therefore he has legitimate legislative authority over us. So I might say, has it that God has it in view of the right of creation? Whereas Hobbes takes a rather different view. Hobbes is content to trace God's authority to God's omnipotence. So Hobbes says in the Leviathan uh, that dominion that belongs to God, not as creator and gracious, but as omnipotent. Hobbes omnipotence is no word. Um, that's in page 137 of the first edition, the head edition, which is the the way to refer to the Leviathan and view of the being lots of editions. Well, thus, uh, to conclude then, we want to distinguish between the account of, of why a certain agent has supreme legislative authority and the supreme principle of that legislation. And to think of the fundamental law of nature as the latter, as the supreme principle, if you, if you like, in natural law, uh, as that part of the law of God that can be known by reason. Now, when, when I refer to natural law, uh, and you use that term, I will always do so uh, understanding the name in the sense that I have just explain, namely to refer to the law of God that can be known by reason. This is the traditional sense, and it's the sense in which Locke uses it. And I think it's also the central sense, that is the fundamental of nature, particularly the, a central notion. And by saying that, I mean that whenever Locke speaks of natural law, or natural Right, there is usually some reference to the fundamental law of nature, either directly or indirectly. I'd say usually because it isn't, it's not always clear that there is a connection. For example, in the case of the principle of fidelity, that is the principle to honor or to keep our promises or to honor contacts, is a principle that for Locke plainly holds in this day and nature. Uh, he may think, or probably thinks, it's part of, of, of the natural law, but it's not clear, and he, he makes no attempt to show that one can derive it from what I've here called the fundamental law of nature and what he calls it that thing. So I don't know quite how to account for that. But, Say, marginal a few exceptions, and it's normally safe to assume that there is some reference, direct or indirect, to the fundamental law of nature. And in the case of the right to property, for example, uh, the natural right to property in the early stages of the world, it's fairly clear, I think, what the derivation is supposed to be from the fundamental law of nature. I'll talk something about that next time.
Now, at the present time, presently, there's a tendency for people to use the term natural law simply to mean any reasonable ethical or moral principle that can, say, be justified in some way to our reason and that are principles that apply to political and social institutions. So it tends to be among some writers, it's rather broad, broad use and a number of examples of that. Now, I shall not use it in this way. I will use it in this a traditional way. If you use it in this present day way, which one often finds, then utilitarianism, perfectionism, intuitionism, uh, lots of ethical views that philosophers have held in recent centuries would all come, come examples of natural law. Maybe even justice and fairness is an example of natural law. But uh, anyway, I shan't go into that. But it'll always have this sense. Now to come to the fundamental law of nature. And I just imagine a few brief things about that. Some things about the content of it. And you want to read very carefully paragraphs uh, 4, 6 to 12, 57, 134, 135, and 159. Sort of puzzled together. And there are a lot of other places that are, of course, indirectly relevant. And, but picks on the paragraphs anyway to get it started. The general idea, way to state the content is that we are to preserve all mankind and so far as possible, every member of it, and this would include ourselves. So the general way to state it is that all mankind is to be preserved and so far as possible or so far as can consistent with public good, every member of it. That's kind of a general formulation. Uh, Locke also says things like, when all cannot be preserved, then uh, the innocent are to have priority. And an example of the innocent is the following of when he's uh, talking in the chapter on conquest is saying if we're engaged in just war, say the war is won, how are we to treat the people on the other side who fought against us and how are we to make a distinction between them and their families and the property? And their families and the young ones and the wives and so forth and so on are among the innocent. And their Safety has to be included among all those who are to be preserved. I mean, only take enough of their land to repay the cost of war to us. And even that's brought into question if that cuts us so deeply into their means of life that they are put in danger. So uh, that that's a gloss on the, on the innocent. You have to look through the text to see uh, when these um, notions appear in order to draw out the content a bit. Allah says in this beginning paragraph, paragraph 6, that uh, we cannot destroy animals or other living things in, in nature, I take him to say, without a nobler cause, I take him to mean by that, unless uh, we need it somehow. So you can't, just can't go around um, killing animals, cutting up trees, and so forth and so on. Those are things that God has made for our well-being, and we have to respect them. So that's behind the Borlish clause, in the case of property, where we don't take so much out of the common, uh, this early sense that we can actually use in this, in this early state, and think of it putting adoption of money as a practice. So those are few indications of the general content of that principle. Now, there's an implication, the way I read it, is that there's an implication to equality comes out of this. 
which he talks about in four and elsewhere. In other words, I'm connecting it that way. So there's an implication to equality. The implication being that the that is the implication made is that the state of nature is a state of equal rights. Where equal rights means a state of equal political jurisdiction. Marx says in 123 that each person is, well, he says all men are king. That's what we might say. Everyone is a sovereign in the state of nature. That means a political sovereign. They have jurisdiction over their own person, their own body, their legitimate possessions. And that's a kind of sovereignty. And, and, and it's equal and it's reciprocal. Now, the entrance to that. The grounds on which it is based is that Marx says, in the absence of God having designated someone as God's own lieutenant and someone who is to have political power and to exercise it in God's behalf, in the absence of God having done that, and Marx thinks it's obvious or it's a fact that God has not done that, then everyone is equal on the ground that they all have the capacity necessary natural capacity with some exceptions that is to say children before the age of reason um, idiots and those who have been disturbed in the song but naming aside that if we assume that everyone has the normal powers of human reason logical of these exceptions then everyone has the capacity to exercise political jurisdiction over themselves and that's what's relevant, capacity to exercise over ourselves, political jurisdiction. Locke is not saying, as he makes perfectly clear in chapter 6, that in section 54, I'm sorry, paragraph 54, he makes clear there that there are all kinds of differences between people of status and rank, ability, and wealth, and so forth and so on. But these are not relevant differences when it comes to who has and who does not have equal political jurisdiction of themselves. So that's the way I read it, uh, how I would interpret it. So there are these, uh, the inference to equality, then, or the inference to equal political jurisdiction, is an inference based on the absence of God's designation of lieutenant and equality of vast majority of people in relevant respects to exercise political jurisdiction of themselves. Now, we then, another aspect of the fundamental law of nature is that to drop out of this, uh, the two rights, the executive right of the law of nature that we each have in the state of nature and the right to our own self-preservation. The exactly right is introduced in paragraphs 7 to 11, uh, the right to self-preservation in 6 and 11. And a lot of other paragraphs also uh, where it is discussed. Okay, and that brings us to uh, number four. Is this okay so far? Mm -hmm. Thing, uh, okay. Well, I want to discuss under number four Bach's main thesis, social contract thesis, about the principle that he applies to political inst institutions. Now, this thesis is dated in many places in the Latin treatise, but I'll begin with 95, where he gives a fairly clear statement there. Uh, 95. Uh, men being, as has been said by nature, all free and independent, no one can be put out of this state 
and subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. The only way whereby anyone divests himself of his natural liberty and puts on the bonds of civil society is by agreeing with other men to join and to unite to some community, or into a community. Now, Mamak's main thesis says, I take it that not only can we be subject to political power by our own consent, but we are subject to it in no other way. There's no other way that that can happen to come about. And it is the esthesis of which he thinks is required by the, the various implications he's drawn from the fundamental law of nature. And Marx's argument for this I will try uh, to formulate. Now, let's begin, though, by recalling the definition of political authority, which is a very particular form of, of power. And remember that power is a form, is a a bundle of rights. It's not force. We're talking about authority. Power is a bundle of rights in connection, of, say, in the political case, with having some sorts of authority. And Locke says in paragraph 3, the very outset, that political power is the right of making laws with penalties of death and therefore all lesser penalties for the regulation and preserving of property. We'll have to talk about on Friday what property means. And employing the force of the community in the execution of such laws and in defense of commonwealth or from injury all for the public good. There are a lot of notions in here that we'll have to uh, or that you'll have to come clear about. Uh, you don't have time to go into it. And I, I mentioned, keep in mind, power uh, is a bundle of rights in some sort. It's not force. You make that distinction between the two. Now, observe carefully that this thesis, what I call the social contract thesis, is limited to political power. Locke emphatically is not saying that all duties and obligations in general arise by agreement or consent or from contract. Let's go over some examples. Obviously, our duties to God don't arise from consent. Not only serve, but the thought is exactly uh, Our obligation to the fundamental law of nature it doesn't arise. It's a consequence of the emphasis that we talk. The political obligation arises from consent. A more interesting case is that our, our duty to honor our parents, our father and mother, does not arise from consent. It's a duty we acquire by being born in the family and as a child having been raised by certain people and so forth. And Locke says that even a king can never be released of his duty to his mother. Never. It's perpetual. So that doesn't arise by consent. And that's a somewhat interesting example of, because it's a, it's, a, it's a moral case and it obviously just isn't being considered. I mentioned earlier the case of principle of fidelity itself. Now there would be kind of a paradox by trying to account for that as arising from consent. So we have to pull that aside. Again, the duty to respect the property of others does not derive from consent. And here, of course, I have my property in the state of nature. Well, before political power, say, well, before let's just say in the early stages uh, property in the state of nature that does not arise from consent but Locke thinks it's a consequence of, na of natural law if all mankind are to be preserved and if the things in nature are the necessary means of, of, of sustenance then if we're also 
scattered about the world and we can't get together to make an agreement, that's impossible, we will either starve to death or appropriate to ourselves proper amounts for our own needs. So that that fact that we have height of property in this sense in this early stage is a consequence of the fundamental law of nature plus these other facts and in no way depends on consent. Mark is very concerned about this because Filmer had argued against it and we'll talk more about property on, on Friday. But that's an example at this point. Again, the fundamental law of nature, as I mentioned, poses these restrictions about the innocent and those don't either arise by our consent. And there are other examples, I suggest that you can take of other examples uh, that appear from time to time in the text. But those are some more obvious ones. So it's mm -hmm. limited to political authority and to political obligation. Now, what we want to do is to get a sketch of what this argument is like. Uh, what form does it take? I see I'm falling behind a bit, so I will go over this reasonably briefly in the hope of giving you a, a general idea of how I think it goes. And we also might consider, actually, if you consider how much of an argument it is against his opponents, or is he just developing another point of view? That all I uh, postpone until later. I think we can think of his argument as an argument from cases. And one way of organizing, I don't say that it means the only way of organizing, but one way of organizing say the early parts of the book, up until it begins to talk about the um, Constitution, is to think of it as organized it by cases. Now by that I mean the following. We take a list of cases that's reasonably complete and which we have for thinking that different kinds of rights and duties can be based upon. Say we take the duty of parental power or paternal power, and I prefer to call it parental power, or take the right of property, uh, and take the right of conquest and war, and other alternatives to what political power might be based on. And he discusses, say, the right of property, the basis of political power, that's partly what he has in mind in, in five. He discusses a parental power as a basis of political authority in six, because he's arguing against Fillmore, who particularly in six has said that political authority derives from Adam. God created Adam and gave Adam the world for Adam to own. Adam owned it as his private property. And Adam also had political authority over Eve, who was created from his rib and so on. He had political authority over his sons and daughters. And it was sort of thing passed down uh, by, as it were, inheritance. And that may strike you rather odd view. But the point was, uh, <laughs> Filmer's views were published in 1680. They had great appeal to the moralist cause, and Locke felt he had to argue against it. And you should notice that his name is occasionally mentioned, and there are no summers against Filmer from time to time in these early parts. So he feels he has to refute these views. So it's to this kind of argument by cases that we go through these arguments and we try to show that they don't work in every instance, except what Locke thinks is the one that does work, the case is being based on our consent. 
So for an argument of this kind to work, the Nessa cases should be fairly complete. And there's ought not to be any obvious sort of case that, that we might overlook uh, that might serve as an alternative basis of the consent for political authorities. It ought to be that each right or each basis has a fairly clear meaning, accepted meaning amongst us, uh, so that we can appeal to it as a mock does, as something more or less clearly understood. And the founding of political authority on consent for Locke's view to work must strike us as very plausible. Uh, we might not think it's a knockout as it is, but if we think it's plausible and none of the other cases work, then obviously it's a better argument. Uh, of course, it might be if we found it very implausible, we might be driven to the conclusion that there's no legitimate basis for political authority at all, and we'd be anarchists or something of that sort. Uh, but Mach thinks that is a persuasive argument and the alternatives um, he tries to deal with. So that's the general form of the argument. Now, I don't think, however, it's a mere list. That is, it's not as, as we sort of grab these alternatives because they were are around. But if we look at the case of parental power, now, parental power is a power that parents have because their sons and daughters are in a state of immaturity. They do not reach the age of reason. Uh, it's a phrase, old fashioned phrase. Uh, when we reach the age of reason, we are, of course, become independent and free, and we then have political jurisdiction over ourselves. So it's only a defect. Well, since it's a normal thing, we won't say it's a defect. We'll say it's a fact of nature about human beings that they are born young and they have to grow up and there's an interval of time. And during that time, others have to, have to look after uh, their interests and, and their welfare. So because of that, there is a parental power. So you could try to account for these other alternatives. Uh, why there are these other powers that uh, one has to deal with uh, that are other than a consent. So, then uh, to proceed, then briefly at the end, I want to say, uh, we'll just summarize what I take it that the view is. That Lamarck is going at the beginning from a state of equal right, which is a state of equal political jurisdiction. And he wants to say that a political regime will be legitimate if it is, is a regime that could have been contracted into from a state of equal right without anyone violating the fundamental law of nature in any a variety of respects. That is, the fundamental law of nature requires us, say, to respect the innocent. So in that process, uh, we can't violate that. It also uh, requires us to act in ways that um, preserve all my kind, et cetera, so far as possible um, every member of it. So we have to honor that. Also, oh, we cannot grant uh, more power than we have over ourselves. So the power that we give to kings and to other sovereigns cannot exceed the power that uh, we have over ourselves. We also have the duty to preserve ourselves, uh, to look after uh, in a far-seeing way our legitimate interest. And Locke also assumes that we are rational. That is, if we will not enter into an agreement if it does not improve our condition. In that sense, we are rational. So what he's going to assume is that, is that the is this process of agreement that takes place 
that eventually ends up with the contact of, of society that establishes a political regime. And it has to satisfy, beginning from the state of nature, the state of equal political right, it has to satisfy all of these conditions at each time. So when money is agreed to, debt has to be rational. I'm presuming that's some sort of a passive convention. But I'm presumably it is also an agreement that can be made subject to these conditions. When tribes in the early stages of the world agree to their boundaries and to their borders, and therefore establish tribal territories, that also presumably fulfill these conditions. And at the time of the social compact and the society that was established, or whenever that was, it must be the case that that establishment and the terms of the compact uh, fulfill these conditions. Now, all this may seem to you a rather vague view, a vague account. And in a way, maybe from a modern standpoint, it is a vague account. But you have to remember what Locke's problem is. He wants to argue against royal aspiration. So in a way, his target is fairly, from our standpoint, an easy target to argue against. He doesn't have to show in any detail the kinds of constitutions that could result, so long as the mixed constitution that he and the great respect is within the bounds of the kind that could be contracted into. You must be able to give a plausible argument for that, given the conventions of the time, and he must also, and you should notice this is one of his main objectives throughout, um, comes out particularly in sections in 90, paragraphs in 90 to 94. He wants to argue against royal absolutism. Um, he's aiming at that. So, his argument against absolutism is quite simple. That he disagrees with Hobbes, he's saying this state of nature is not so bad. There is something worse, namely being under an absolute government. That's even worse. And therefore, since we would never make any agreement except to better ourselves, and since in this hypothetical way, we begin from the state of nature, it could never be the case that there was and a social compact which established an absolute regime within the bounds of the law of nature and which was rational. It could not satisfy those general conditions. And that is, in a very uh, simple way, the nature of his argument. Yes? Self-regarding. Well, I want to use it the way I I think a lot does, and I think it. What? That's a very good question. It's not. A, um, it's a little. It's somewhat anachronistic in a way we have to decide, but the way I would want to answer the case of Locke or something like this, that for him, the good thing, one might say, in some sense of our, that we have to protect, are our lives, memories, and states, and all property is under that, and there's a broader and narrow sense of property. So what I want to say is that we all have an interest in those things. And we also all have an interest, I think he would allow, uh, in terms of our affections uh, for our own families and so on. But it's not an interest that's going to include all society by any means. It will be fairly much of our own circle, you might say. It might include some other people, 
But it will certainly include, under rationale, the, the protection of our liberties, the exercise of rights, um, and also our properties, however that gets interpreted. So in that sense, I don't think it's the same notion as the Thomas notion. Um, but it's, it's, I think, more like an ordinary, uh, well, there's this thing, ordinary sense of rationality. It's very much like Hume's notion, again, in the treatise, although we don't go into that. But I would define it relative to taking rational proof steps to what will make us better off as judged by prospect of our preserving our life, exercising our rights, maintaining our liberty and our property, that kind of, of, of a notion. Uh, does that help? Yeah, I was just wondering if you, if you were too self regarding the sort of free rider problem, where an individual would think that he could assert his duty to social contact if everybody felt that way to social contact. Um, well, that raises a different kind of question. Um, yeah, well, maybe I better um, take it up later, but that doesn't enter Locke's mind, really, except insofar as he talks about the necessity of sanctioning the case of the national law. Um, 